Hey guys, on today's episode, we're joined by Nina Rapita from Dawson's Creek fame. We talk about Dawson, we talk about all the stuff about Dawson's Creek, some fan questions. We also talked about her son who stars in the new Netflix movie, Devil All the Time. Guys, this is the show, and it starts right now. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking this time to join us. I was blown away by how much um, fan questions we got when I put out um, on a bunch of the Dawson's Creek uh, Facebook groups, kind of the, you know, we had you coming on the show and if there was any questions and it blew up between there and Instagram to the point where there's no way we're going to be able to do all the questions that they have in the time we have, like that could take up a whole nother hour probably. Wow, uh, that's we're, exciting. We're, Maybe we're I can come so. back for part two. For sure. Well, I'll <laughs> just do a Q&A with you. Um, but I want to ask right off the bat, um, let's talk about your son, actually, you know, with that. He just came out in a brand new Netflix movie, um, The Devil of All Time. I, I've seen your post on social medias with him. Like, you can tell, like, that is one of your driving, um, I guess, forces maybe in life right now is kind of his career and just him in general. Talk a little bit about Banks and um, where he's at with it before we get into the Dawson talk. Well, um I, I married my college sweetheart, Mike, who is a camera operator. And about 12 years ago, plus nine months, there was a writer's strike in the industry. And so we weren't working. We were both at home. And then things started smelling funny and I was pregnant. So uh, we know how it happened that in the regular way, we maybe we should have named Banks Writer's Strike. But um, Banks grew up going to film sets and... Um, and the way he, the way he got his first part is I was booked on a commercial and the kid slated to play my kid, something happened. And so my agent called and said, would Banks do it? And, um, then she told me how much he got paid. And I was like, yes, he will be happy to do it. <laughs> and, um, and so I went to Banks, he was uh, five or six years old. And I said, Banks, you're going to work with mom tomorrow. And he was like, okay. And I said, well, actually you're going to be working. And he said, what do I got to do? I said, you're going to be acting. And he said, wait a minute, what do I got to do? I go, you just have to be my kid. And he holds up his hands and he goes, wait a minute, hold up. Are there any cuddling scenes? Because I don't do cuddling scenes. So that's how Banks got, got uh, his first job. And then my agent signed him. And uh, yeah, Devil All the Time has picked up a lot of traction lately. Last I heard it was number one on Netflix. And it was a very emotional role. It was some heavy acting for Banks. Um, it shot in Birmingham, Alabama, which was a spectacular trip for us. I, I had booked a role on a different show and I had to turn it down because somebody has to be with Banks and uh, we don't really have a whole lot of family or I, I didn't really have anybody to pawn him off on. And the part was so emotional I didn't want him to be, you know, out there alone without somebody. So that was very exciting for me. And yes, in many ways, I feel like uh, where I'm at personally in the film business is that in many ways I've handed the torch to Banks. And as long as he's having a good time, uh, then that's great. But I never try to pressure him. But he's, in my opinion, quite good. Not just a, not, not just mother's pride um I, I think he's actually good and others say the same so we'll see if he uh, enjoys doing it we'll keep on doing it he has another film coming out called uncle frank um that was directed by alan ball and it's a funny part and they dyed his hair bright red so <laughs> so yeah um yeah maybe maybe you could interview banks you could do a podcast with banks uh, that would be awesome he uh he definitely um like stole the scenes that he was in in that first half and I mean it really that that was a about a two hour movie and he I mean I think the first 45 50 minutes is really mm -hmm. like it's all him in the main character role um which was really cool to kind of see and the way he interacted I mean it, 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 if you haven't seen it out there you, you have to watch it he did amazing truly like I mean I yeah stars Tom Holland and Bill Skarsgård and uh, Robert Pattinson. So he was hanging out with the big boys. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, well, we'll definitely have to get him on the show if he'd be willing to do it. Um, you know, cause I think that'd be awesome to kind of hear how that experience was and, you know, kind of coming into Hollywood, um, growing up in it truly with you mm -hmm. guys. So 
Um, I want to, uh, you know, obviously we want to talk about some Dawson's Creek. How was, how was that whole experience? I mean, just, I mean, we've talked about before we started recording how much of a pop culture icon it still is and how it still keeps going. And on Hulu, I think it's still one of the top rated shows on there. Um, I just finished rewatching it again for like, I don't know how many times now. Um, how was that whole process for you? It was surreal on many levels because um, I I already lived in Wilmington, North Carolina. I, I'm a North Carolina girl. Um, so Mike and I were both in the film business. And then my husband got an opportunity to be a camera assistant on a show in um, at Universal Studios in Hollywood. So we jumped at that chance and we went out there. But as it is in Hollywood, you never have any kind of guarantee of work. You don't know what's going to last and what's not. And by the time Mike's show was canned, I had already started auditioning a lot. And um, people may not be aware, but Wilmington, North Carolina had already uh, been a hub for um, Screen Gym Studios. It was actually Dino De Laurentiis Studios and movies like Firestarter and TV shows like Matlock, uh, the movie King Kong. Uh, they were filmed in Wilmington. So Wilmington already had a really strong uh, film base and crew base. And one of the directors that directed Matlock episodes was a man named Leo Penn. Leo Penn was Sean Penn's father and a very interesting man. And he cast me in several episodes of Matlock. And at lunch, he kept saying, none of you are in the geographic wrong location uh, to be any more than just a day player role. When you come out to LA, give me a call. And so I did. And he hooked me up with his friend who was an agent. And so I was I was going on auditions in Hollywood at the time that Mike's show got canned. So we stayed until the money ran out. But I had already auditioned for a pilot called Dawson's Creek. So the interesting part of the story is that we left we left Hollywood and uh, and then I got cast in the pilot and they were very apologetic to let me know it shoots in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is where we live actually the water <laughs> right like literally one creek over from the location of the potter bnb so i could literally take my boat to work if i wanted to when we shot at that location so that part of it really i have to say is like the mighty hand of god you know it's like no budding actress goes to hollywood and then gets to work on a tv show that shoots in the town that she loves you know i didn't i wasn't born in wilmington but I love Wilmington. I love the salt water. I love everything about this town. I love history. So um, working on Dawson's Creek was spectacular because each episode was really like a little movie. There wasn't, it wasn't like regular television of the day back then, like television shows like Seinfeld or Friends were typically sets, you know, and there was a set and there, there, there was a set, but we did a lot on location. And as Kerr had mentioned, as the show started to pick up, popularity people would show up there are no rules you know of uh, you can't be on front street when they're filming on front street so police would lock it up and as it gained popularity uh it was it was really exciting to have these crowds show up and want autographs and want to you know they want to see they want to see pacey and they want to see you know uh james and katie and michelle and um so it was interesting because i wasn't the main star i'm kind of uh you know the sister of uh of katie on the show so it was it was a lot like being in high school like there were times where uh you know people would you know you have trailers the actors have their honey wagons in their trailers where they wait like their dressing rooms of sorts and there would be days where it would be the day let's toilet paper james's trailer you know which <laughs> made it troublesome for the transportation department. But um, yeah, it was really surreal on many levels. And then as it picked up popularity and um, particularly um, what, um, what Dawson's Creek did with music was they were pioneers on many levels, but on each episode when they would choose music and pair it with the show, that was, that was spectacular. And there were concerts along the way. Um, with those recording artists. And that part was really exciting for me because um, I love music. How, um, how was it getting to play 
and, and this is actually a fan question, so I'm going to jump to one of to one of these questions here because I think it kind of fits perfectly here. Um, I got to find out where it went on that question. Uh, all right, so TJ Basham asks, um, were you and Katie very close? You guys played sisters on the show. So many, you guys had a lot of emotional scenes together. Definitely in that mom sister role um, with her. Um, but how you know were you guys close on set? Was that a kind of a was there that sisterly bond there? Or was it more? Um, I'm not maybe sure how that works. yeah, um, maybe a little bit of both. Um, I think mostly we kept it professional, and I don't know. Um, there were gatherings, you know, where we would all go to the beach or go to dockside, but for the most part, I think my, um, you know, Katie's from a very large family, and um, I don't have sisters. I'm the only girl of brothers, and most of our um, relationship had to do with uh, the writing and being on set together. Uh, we did not do a whole lot outside, uh, little bits here and there, but not a whole lot. It would be really nice if, if we did, but sometimes, you know, people, I'm a bit older than Katie, so, uh, you know, there was, uh, there was that factor. So, um, but nothing but absolute respect and love for her on every level. And then we would run into each other uh, downtown and places around Wilmington, but um, she had her own group and um, but there was uh, absolute love and respect, uh, particularly on the set. I, I really enjoyed working with her because um, there's an organic a organicness that comes like particularly that first season where, you know, no one was some, no, no one was a big star. So we really were, I think all of us, and I know I can speak for myself. We really felt like we were creating something really special. Kevin Williamson, who created the show um, that first season was there and very uh, hands-on and he's so talented. Uh, He's so talented, so very talented, and he really had a vision for what he wanted, and um, it was just spectacular what that show did and how it resonated with what was going on in people's lives. I mean, the the letters and fan mail that I've received over the years has been about how those different topics touched their lives, and there wasn't a show on TV like that at the time. So, no, I definitely think um, you know I was just going into high school when the show came out um, in, in the beginning there. And it was, it definitely had a way to kind of help. Even if you didn't relate to this, to like one part of the story, just different parts that happened when they were in high school and the different storylines there or the interactions with the parents and with you and, the, you know, and just with everyone, it definitely had a way to resonate with life um, with it. And I think you guys did a fantastic job of kind of building that um, with it and making it as much as sometimes there's the, the funny memes of, of DOS is that are kind of the very wordiness of it. Um, right. You guys definitely had a way to kind of make it fit into like a real life kind of world. Um, it wasn't too far out of the, you know, in the, in the, I guess in the Hollywood world, it fit into like people's lives. And I, it, you guys should be different out of that. Um, do you wish that there was more done with your character? Well, of course I do. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I, I, um, it's interesting how, especially like my, my family is quite funny, you know, they're like, why aren't you on the radio? And why didn't, you know, why didn't this and why didn't that? And, um, you know, uh, I think that as the, as the show that, especially that first season writers and the powers that be producers and networks, they are always wanting to be on the cutting edge of what's going to grab what's going to grab, you know, the audience. So of course I would have loved for something to uh, develop from Bessie, but, but it didn't. So that's uh, <laughs> uh, out of my control. It's funny because when I listened to Kerr's uh, podcast that you did with him, I started doing the math and I was thinking, you know, the baby, my baby, Alexander, could be playing high school football if uh, if Kerr was the football coach in Cape Side at Cape Side High, then Alexander could be on the team and he could maybe be uh, troublesome in some way, and then I would be like the Grams, you know, <laughs> and it would be like this roll up effect. I could be like the Grams of uh, well, hey, you. You and Kerr need to get together because, like, um, he, he mentioned in there about that. Um, I think it was Dalen had written. Um, they had a script they were pending and trying to kind of 
relaunch. And right. I guess that would be a cool kind of way to, you know, the bring Potter everybody B &B back. Could still be going. Yeah, the Potter B&B <laughs> could still be in action and, and the kid could be problematic. And, you know, I would need, I would need Joey to come and save the day because I think Bessie's a little, uh, you know, raw around the edges and marks to the beat of her own drum. So uh, that was my idea there. That's how was um. Let me find this one question. I want to make sure I get it. Um, Christine Maloney asked, you know, about the you and the Brody storyline, and how was or for Bodie, not Brody. Sorry. Bodie. Um, how was that storyline to kind of be? I mean, definitely a. I don't want to say hot topic kind of thing, but um, maybe like a cultural kind of a, a, a change there with it, which definitely Dawson's push the um, push to break any of those barriers and say, look, life is life. And, right. You know, and love is love. That. You know, yeah. um, it's interesting because uh, Wilmington, North Carolina is, you know, in the South, you know, and at the time that was a huge uh, uh that was a huge thing when people saw uh, people of two different races, whether it was African American and white, or whether it was Asian and white, or whether it was you know Mexican and Indian, or whatever it was at that time. It was a uh, it was it was something that was shunned upon. And what's what's interesting is that love love truly is blind, you know. So I love that they put that in. Uh, in the storyline because today it just doesn't even seem like a big deal you know it doesn't even uh, seem like a big deal but at the time particularly in north carolina and the pockets that actually still exist um that was a something not a nothing and i uh people if i was at the grocery store shopping I, uh, there were two events where people said things to me that were not very kind we'll just leave it at that back then it, it was shocking really for me and and even some of my own family members too were like uh okay and what's interesting too what's funny is i think the uh gentleman who played bodhi my my husband was in the camera department so some of the scenes where we're kissing and stuff it's like my husband was like two feet away <laughs> in real life so that's a little bit uh that's a little bit awkward i guess more more so for him than me but um anyway um so yeah that was that was interesting and i think that you know once that was established it's like okay that's done and then everything else that they pressed in on all the uh juicy topics you know the older teacher relationship the uh cur cur being gay and all that became more, actually maybe even more important to press in on at the time you know all right let's do some fan questions if you're ready i'm ready craig edwards um yes. asked, how was your recent reunion with dawson's first team pa oh my word i love craig edwards craig edwards is like craig edwards is the glue that holds us all together so interesting fact history was made recently so craig Craig was the PA on Dawson's Creek. God bless him. He had to like make sure we didn't disappear or we, he had to make sure that we weren't gone when they needed us. And, uh, you know, that I will just openly say, I may have taken Craig for granted back then, but I will never take him for granted again. Uh, some, something most precious happened recently is Banks worked on a film and Craig was his, uh, PA in charge of Banks, the kid. So it was history had been made, you know. So Craig Edwards has now worked with two generations of the same family on a film set. And um, I love him so much. He's amazing. He is so amazing. He's the like glue. He's like actually uh, you, yeah, uh, he's actually the one running the whole show. Nobody knows that. But Craig Edwards is in charge. He is the grand puppeteer. <laughs> I might, I'm going to have to reach out to him and try to get him on the show to hear some. Uh, oh, you know, listen, the stories he can tell. I don't know. I don't know if the actors want him on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save him for the end if we can get more people. Um, <laughs> all right. Let's see. We have um, April Farmer Gossip. What was your favorite Bessie moment? Oh, um, 
there was uh, there was an episode we where we were all around the fire, and oh. um, we and that might have even been on a Friday, and we were all sitting around. So my favorite Bessie moment was probably that sweet moment where there really was no dialogue or anything. We were all together sitting in, at the Potter B&B around the fire. That, that would be my number one uh, moment. All right. Uh, what other actors? And then also, no, 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 let me back it up because oh, the lipstick, uh, the pilot scene, putting the lipstick on uh, Joey, it, that was like a really, that's an awesome, that was an awesome scene. That was an awesome actor moment. That was, uh, that was incredible. I, I, that's probably my favorite. Like, I can't pick just one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jamie Simpson says, what other actors or actresses would you have liked your character to work with more? Um, uh, within Dawson's Creek? Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, well, I got to work a little bit with uh, Pacey, and um, Josh Jackson is uh, a phenomenal human being and funny and zany, and uh, he's one of these people that just makes you want to create uh, and be in the moment. Um, and then also Mary Margaret, like uh, Dawson's mom. I, that would have been interesting to develop a little more between the parental figures, even though I wasn't Joey's parent, uh, that could have been interesting, you know, if we argued more or, or, or I don't know. Um, yeah. All right. Um, Mike uh, Summerlin asks, where does she think Bessie would be today? And we kind of touched on that kind of with your thought of like where, you know. Oh, right. If we were in Cape Side High, I think like, procured more properties and try to get into the Airbnb thing. She might be charged with tax evasion and trying to, uh, <laughs> you know, follow in the dad's footsteps. And then the son, uh, Bodie would have left her high and dry and the son would be good, but have a thread of problems that follow him. So she would just constantly be trying to clean up the mess that life brings when you're trying to get ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see, let's go with how, um, he, he had another question. How was it working with Andy Griffith on, on Matlock? Oh man, now I'm showing my age. Matlock was incredible. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, we may not be reaching the demographic of people that watch the show Matlock, but Matlock is still on the air too. Talk about a show that never goes away. Um, Andy Griffith it was, uh, just a jolly old man and he was like any man that was, uh, older, once you got him to talking, he was talking. So uh, Mike and I both worked on Matlock as well, too. Um, that was incredible because he was, I, I he was, a, he was an icon, you know, um, of his, of his generation, but that generation is now much older. We're talking, you know, 70 and 80 year olds. Well, that's not true. Some people watch daytime TV, so. but yeah, Matlock's still on the air. <laughs> oh my Let's see, we'll go one more question from Mike um, before we have to wrap up. Uh, what was, we talked about what was your favorite. You were the queen of the day in Wilmington. Is that right? It's azalea. So there is a plant that grows in Wilmington, North Carolina called the azalea. And it's a pink flower and they're spectacular. They grow some, some azalea plants grow like 12 feet, 15 feet high here. And so they have a festival and have had a festival for many, 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 many years, like 50 or 60, maybe even more wow. years. They've had the Azalea Festival and they choose a television star to be the queen. And it's a huge event and all the government and dignitaries from all around come and there's a humongous parade and there are parties. And um, Alonzo Wilson, who was the uh, wardrobe designer for Dawson's Creek, generously graciously dressed me as the queen and i was uh historically written up as the best dressed queen in the history of the azalea festival and um yeah that that may have been my favorite part of dawson's creek is my relationship with alonzo and how it feels as an actor when you have the right wardrobe it's everything goes right so love him mm -hmm. all right um, let's see. I got one last question. This was an Instagram question. 
um, from free to be me uh, KFB. She asked, um, let's see here. Uh, love your music and your screen presence. So when will we get to see you on the screen again? And could you describe your ideal character to play? Oh, wow. My ideal character to play would be like a boho singing, uh, earthy, quirky, funny, uh, love child. <laughs> hope that answered the question. As far as music, um, I still um, I have three albums. It's it, it was a surprise to me. Turns out Singapore. The people in Singapore love my album and they are the ones that buy my album the most. So thank you, Singapore. We love you. And uh, WHQR 91.3 is going to be replaying a concert this Friday and Saturday night, seven to eight Eastern Standard Time. You can probably log on uh, with the internet. It's the uh, National Public Radio uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina. So that concert's gonna replay and uh, Maybe someone will write that part for me. Is she a writer? <laughs> write it. Hey, write it because I know a cameraman that can shoot it. I'm sleeping with him. It's my husband. <laughs> How, um, this is a, I, I want to talk about music before we have to wrap up. And, and I, I know you have to go. How is, you know, you mentioned that you have three albums out. How did music come to be something um, big for you to kind of transition to? And how has that been? Uh, music was always there. Music was always there. I, I've always had a band. I've always been playing either in clubs or events. Um, that was before Dawson's Creek. So, um, so there really was no like real transition. It really became about if I was working and booked, I couldn't really book uh, gigs um, because I didn't know if I'd be available or not with uh, the bands. But that's that I've been singing my whole life. So I was, so that wasn't really a transition. Oh, and uh, during, during this pandemic, I've been playing a lot more piano and I have a um, spa music, some meditation, uh, meditation type piano music. That's going to be the next album coming out. So, uh, well, yeah. I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know you got a full schedule um, of stuff. Where can people follow you on social media? Okay, so nine Nina Rapetta on Instagram and uh, Nina Rapetta on Facebook and um, and then Banks Rapetta's on there too. So uh, maybe you should have Banks uh, maybe you should have Banks on your show next because uh, in many ways I feel like my greatest joy is being able to pass the torch to the kid. Uh, I still audition uh, and I still have an agent and uh, but I don't have anything nothing to share about coming up for me uh yet would be the magic word but um so that's that thank you so much for your interest and thank you for having me on the show and uh thanks to all the fans who ask questions i really appreciate it yeah uh, we'll definitely me on I mean, we'll, we'll definitely hopefully we can uh, get you on for a, just a q a session and cover all these other questions people had asked as well but for sure we want to get Banks on. It would be a great episode to hear kind of how that experience was. Right on. Thanks for having me, Josh. I appreciate it. Thank you, and have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Show with Hollywood JDT and Stuntman Kirk. Want to stay in the know on all things sports, wrestling, movies, and TV? Follow the show on social media at The Show Podcast. If you like today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And we'll catch you next time on The Show.